Welcome to the Core Women Podcast, the place for women entrepreneurs, authors, and self-starters looking to build community and gain valuable insight through expert interviews with women at the top of their game. Join your host, podcaster, producer, expert coach, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Summer Watson, as she aims to inspire and empower you through these candid conversations. Lean in and embrace the journey. It's time to start the show. Here's your host, Dr. Summer Watson. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Destiny Amaris Perkins, who is a multicultural woman consisting of Black, Mexican, Japanese, and Greek roots. Destiny is currently serving as Miss Black Global 2022 to 2023, and through that title, her mission is to inspire young women in identifying their purpose. She is 20 years old, working as a community health specialist for Vista Community Clinic. Within that position, she also works with North San Diego NAACP Youth Council and local Black student unions. She also interns as an advocacy core organizer for Friends Committee on National Legislation, working on the Truth and Healing Commission. Through this internship, she is connecting constituents to their members of Congress throughout California's 49th district. Her career goal is to create a business within the beauty industry and educational field. There is so much to talk about, so let's get right into this and welcome Destiny. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to have met you and crossed paths with you so that we can have this conversation today. Yes, I'm honored to have you here. I'm excited to have you here. Your background is incredible. I love it. It's wonderful. But before we dive into your professional journey, what is that one word that describes your journey thus far? So the word that I believe would best describe my journey is acceptance. And the reason why I say acceptance is because I'm accepting where I come from. I'm accepting who I was created to be and my upbringing, but I also on the flip side, accept where I'm going. And I accept that just because my path, my past may have put me in communities and put me in situations that I may not have loved growing up, that doesn't determine where I'm going in life. So I also accept my goals and my dreams and believe that all of that will come true as well. Mm. I believe, and this is just me, that we make our dreams come true. And I believe that you absolutely can. And I'm so excited for you and so excited for you to be here. I love that word acceptance. That is such a powerful word. Accepting of yourself, accepting of your journey and accepting where you are right now. That is so exciting. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for that word. So can you tell us, because there's so much rich depth and history to your background. Can you tell us a bit about your role in relation to Miss Black Global of the Year and what that is, what that means to you. Can you describe that? Yeah, so I've had a history of being in pageants. And before I had ever joined a pageant, you know, we have the stigma, right? There's some, there's girls are stuck up. They come from wealthy families. You know, they're really all about beauty, not about service. So when I came across Miss Black Global, I met the director and she's like, listen, you know, I love everything that you're doing, but I want you to know what we stand for. And we stand for like we're basically um, service agents, right? We are here, public servants, um, to serve the community, to inspire and to help people because most of pageant work, you know, is volunteerism. So mm-hmm. you have to be willing to give back to your community. And I'm like, okay, this is the perfect pageant for me because that's that's who I am. I'm always looking to give. Um, and we know through the law of attraction and through Newton's third law, right? Every action has the same or opposite reaction. So what we give, we receive. And through this pageant, I've seen that firsthand. So I'm surrounded by a bunch of beautiful young women um, between middle school to the oldest. Is she's, in th- she's 38 years old, and they're just out here doing amazing things. So my, my overall purpose is just to really inspire them and make sure they understand you, whatever you're wanting to do, however I can help you get there, I'm going to try to make that happen. Because I've seen people do that in my life, and I want to be a mentor to them as well. Oh, I love that. I love breaking down stigmas and it sounds like that's part of what you're doing too with the whole thought about pageants being just about beauty or the outward, right? And what it is, is volunteerism, it's philanthropy. It's so much that is involved there because it's also about being focused on goals 
and achieving those goals and having mentorship and having a support group. And there's so much there to that and so much meaning to that. It's kind of like when I was growing up too, and there was the stigmatism about the fraternal groups and sororities and them about being just these elitist groups. But to me, when I joined a sorority, it was about volunteerism. It was about philanthropy. It was about sisterhood. It was about mentorship. It was about exactly what you're talking about. And I believe that we can make those experiences what we want of them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the next question is, can you tell us a bit about your role as a community health specialist and the different organizations you work with, such as North San Diego County's NAACP Youth Council and Advocacy Corps Organizer for Friends Committee on National Legislation. If I said that right, that's a mouthful. So tell us, more, <laughs> tell us more about this role, the role that you're playing, the organizations you're working with, because this sounds very exciting and I'd love to learn more as would our listeners. Yeah, of course. So those are two different titles. So I'll start with um, the Community Health Organizer. That one is my full-time position right now, and basically, I had learned about it through my NAACP advisor that I worked so closely with in high school, right? When I was in high school, um, I had hopped into the position of Black Student Union president, and I was like, okay, it's my time to create, to provide spaces for these students, came across this advisor. She brought me to all these beautiful opportunities, and now, two years later, post-COVID, we have this position. We've been given grant money to really give back to Black students in our community, educate about the war on drugs, how it's affected marginalized communities, people of color, and we're going to give back, right? So I said, okay, this is awesome. I'm back home in my local town. I'm ready to do this work because being in high school, being in BSU, you learn so much leadership skills and that has stayed with me, you know, since high school. So I want to make sure that I'm able to do that with them. I'm a big youth advocate. So I love working with young people. I mean, people may still consider me young. I'm 20, but I still (laughs) love working with the youth. I know they probably do. I still work with the youth and I want to be a voice for them because I just know in the grand scheme of things, different organizations love to use the youth, right? For volunteering, for their events, but sometimes they don't see them. They don't make those connections. And I want them to know, listen, when we go help other people, like pick their brain a little bit, you know, what if they're doing something you wanted to do? So I'm kind of on the flip. I'm helping both, both sides, trying to see each other's value and worth. So that's what we do in the position. We work with the youth and go to all these different high schools and middle schools. My sister just started a black student union at her middle school, the first ever. They're all in seventh grade. It's so cute. That is, that is beyond cute. That is a movement. That is terrific. I love hearing how young folks are progressing and doing something important in their community and connecting community. So that is terrific. And I love what you're doing. And it's funny because you were born and raised in Oceanside. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting about that, Destiny, is I was, and your background too, I let me take a step back here, but your background too, is you have a father that was in the military or is still is, is he retired now or retired? Yeah. (laughs) Retired. Okay. So we were also on camp Pendleton. My husband was an active duty Marine and I worked in Oceanside for lifeline community organization. And so it's out of Vista now, but there was a site in Oceanside and one in Vista And during that time, I did a lot of work behind Oceanside High School, where there is a large gang population, huge gang population. But I did community services and bringing programs together and the kids together and doing different groups with the kids and with the community to develop programs. And so when I hear that you are doing this as well, with a different organization, doing some different programs, I get really excited because that grassroots change is so valuable. And learning the skill of really being inclusive and bringing community to the table is what makes a difference and makes huge changes. It's not doing it in a silo. Right. No, right. And I don't think people realize how effective grassroots organizing is. Because it's one-on-one, right? We're on, we're on the same um, playing field. 
Right. When I, when I do grassroots organizing, it's never like I'm talking at them or they're talking at me. We're talking to each other. Together. And that's where we get that understanding. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's such an important skill. So tell us more about your goal to create a business with the beauty industry and the educational field, because I know this is a goal for you. Tell us more about that. Yes, I love to touch on that. I also didn't get to um, expand on or definitely want to throw that in there because that's been a major season of my life is a season of policy. I feel like, um, well, at least for people who identify themselves as multifaceted, we're always like, okay, I want to do this and that and this and that. And I feel like that's you too, Summer, because oh, the way yeah. that you're talking about all the things you do, definitely multifaceted human being right here. I decided to not just label myself as one title. I'm like, okay, in this season, I'm doing this. The next season, like a serial entrepreneur, right? Just right. starting new things and moving. So right now, um, with the election that just passed, I still hold this title. It's called an Advocacy Core Organizer. Um, I'm part of a, a cohort, 16 young, young adults from 18 to 26, who were all chosen from different states in this country to basically work on a bill, a national bill called the Truth and Healing Commission, which is this bill essentially is to educate and also provide resources to natives and different reservations around the country. Um, get the information that way back when, when they had the Native American boarding schools trying to assimilate natives into American culture, a lot of uh, family history was lost. A lot of those children were put into families that weren't the families they were taken from through this assimilation. So we're trying to retrieve that data from different churches and different organizations that held these boarding schools. Um, we're trying to get that passed so that way we can reunite families. Um, and then on the other side, also providing water. A lot of these reservations don't have water. They don't have Wi-Fi. They're not safe because they're not gated. So anybody can really go on the reservation. Then you have situations like missing and murdered indigenous women and children. There's so much going on. So we want to make sure this bill gets passed just because we're on native land, you know, and we're on so many sacred practices and things like that. So working in this cohort, there's two natives in our group. And to see their perspective on this, I we can feel and see their pain and why it's just pushing me even more to advocate for this bill. Um, but aside from that, you know, they fly us out to D.C. We go to be able to meet. We are able to meet our representatives, our senators, the staffers, see what it's like to really be involved in political advocacy we go back to our hometowns, our districts, and we actually go do grassroots lobbying. We connect with constituents, people that don't even know who the representative may be. We say, hey, let's get on a lobbying call. Let's just make this connection. And I've had a lot of young high schoolers get on a lobby call recently. Some of them are super passionate and they're just advocating, saying what they feel about this bill. So it really is effective. And it's just giving giving people a voice, letting them know you have a voice and you know we're here to listen. I think that is fabulous because I think it's so important that we give that platform to folks to have the voice because a lot of people feel not just passionate, but they, they feel passionate, but they don't know where to go with that, who to talk to or what those first steps are. And it's like organizations like yours can help navigate those first steps, can help provide platforms for those voices. And I think it's so critical that this happens because this is exactly what we need to start hearing, listening, being active listeners and to make that change and to create community and bringing community to the table to ignite that change. So one of the things that you had touched on just now was having two natives in the group and hearing their passion, hearing where they're coming from. And I think that's so important because those experiences, although they might not have been the ones taken out of the home and put into these schools, we have something called historical trauma. And so that's passed on from generation to generation and to generation. So what you're doing today is also trying to fill in the gaps of those stories to help try and understand And trying to really figure out a way of how can we help these people through and navigate through this, this trauma. So we get a clear picture and we start healing as a community and as a group. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's like most of their, like both of their grandmas, right. Went to boarding schools. It's very recent. I think we look at, you know, we read these history books and like this happened so long ago. Really? It didn't. 
right? right? It really didn't. So hearing their perspective and even them saying, you know, they didn't do a land acknowledgement. You know, we're sitting here yeah. having this meeting. There's a lot of things that mean a lot to them. And I wasn't as aware of that until I joined right. this program. And so it does, it makes me more conscious for them. It makes me recognize microaggressions quicker and things like that. So it, it does bring a lot of awareness. This yeah. young adult program has taught me a lot. So I love what you just mentioned there, Destiny, is having a conscience about this understanding. And I think that uh, this is an example I'm going to use really quickly. We eat meat every day for those of us that eat meat. And what we don't think about is the start to finish process of eating meat and how it gets on the shelves and cooking that meat. And I have a friend who wrote about that and how we desensitize ourselves to that experience. And it gets deep and it get it moves on to different aspects of trauma and so forth and so on and what we're putting into our bodies. But we remove ourselves by not being conscious or aware of others experiences. And I love what you're doing in being actively involved in learning about others experiences, because that brings up a consciousness about it. Right. And you become more connected with it. And so that's why I love these conversations and love the activism that you're participating in because it makes a difference. It brings more understanding. So thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate folks out there who are making changes like this and bringing community together to move those changes forward. So thank you. So yes, tell us more because this is a different aspect of your life. Tell us more about the businesses that you want to create and is this in combination or separately in regards to the beauty industry and how you want to create that business and your intention of bringing education to that field or are those two separate things? Right. So they are two separate things. Think about my, my childhood and the things I didn't have Mm -hmm. and okay, what could I create? to not give that experience to another individual. I feel like that's how business works. It's like, whether it's a product, what can make this easier? Create something, boom, new product. So for me, I, instead of creating a product, I want to create spaces because that's where real growth happens. When you Mm -hmm. feel comfortable, when you feel empowered. And so when I was um, in elementary school, up until where I'm at now, like I've always been an entrepreneur. I used to make bracelets, sell them for 10 cents in fourth grade. I sold candy at school. You know, I always found ways to make money to make sure that wherever I wanted to go, you know, I had the money for it because my mom has that mentality too. You know, she basically raised me majority of my life. So it's like the hustler mentality that if you want it, find a way to get it. So that's just how I was breeding. Um, and so now me thinking, okay, but I want to make more meaningful. I want to make money in a more meaningful way. And that is through businesses. Um, one of my really big goals is to create a curly hair salon because growing up I had, I fought myself a lot with acceptance um, with my natural hair. Mm-hmm. And I talked about this a lot on my social media platforms, but it really was like an identity crisis. I want, again, I wanted to fit in with everybody, but by the time I got to college, I was like, okay, no, like I actually want to just be me and be happy with who I am. So creating a curly hair salon for me would be a place of um, acceptance. It would be educational, even kids, if they're not getting their hair done, but they're like, if we go to Destiny's salon, we'll feel safe there. We'll see this auntie, that auntie, everyone will just be happy and accept us. That's, that's really the goal is to create a healthy space. That is so important. You know, I was watching a show last night and I told my husband, I said, when I was a kid, I watched this show and there was this one lady, she kind of looked like me. And I said, I can identify with her. I identified with her growing up. And that's when I, when I looked and watched that show, I was like, I want to be like her. Right. And I I watched that show today and I'm like, not in every aspect do I want to be like her, but the way she looks really I could connect. Right. And so when you're creating these spaces, you want spaces that where people can connect and they can grow and they can say, I can be myself. I can be myself. And if you don't know what that is, at least you have the space to understand what that is or to learn what that is, because I don't think we know naturally, oh, this is who I am and I can stand in me, right? And yet we learn that and we learn that because of conditioning from our parents, from our clergy, from our educators. And then we have to decide, what do I stand for? What are my values? And yet these spaces that you're thinking about creating 
allows for that. It allows for that acceptance so that people can say, you know what? I believe this. These are my values. This is where I want to be. Um, I was going to say, aside from the curly hair salon, like the education, education part of it, I do want to also have a consulting business. I'm working towards that because I, one thing that I've learned from different mentors online or just in person is identify your gift, you know, mm-hmm. or gift. Because we're given a few. Some of us are given a few. And one of my gifts is connecting with people and I'm quick to find solutions or help them progress. It's like with the have, you know, selling candy in middle school. If a child comes up to me and they're like, I'm a really good artist, you know, I don't have money to this. I'm like, okay, let's try to sell your art on Etsy. Let's take you to a street market. I'm always thinking of how to turn ideas into currency. Like that is one of my gifts. So I'm like, consulting is definitely going to be my thing because I, and I love the end result of like, okay, I was, I was able to help you and push you further in life. I want to be that person. If you meet me, we have conversations and I'm putting you in a better position than when, than you leaving me or hopefully not leaving me, but you know, than when you met, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm, I'm help I'm adding value to your life. So those are just like a few different things, but I know as I get older, I'm going to have even more ideas, but those are the two main ones that are very close to my heart right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I love everything you're doing and your focus and that you are a serial entrepreneur at such a young age, which is fantastic. You know, I love that you're bringing people together and incorporating movements, which bring people to the table, which move people into action. And that is so fantastic. So I love your story. There's going to be so much more of it. I can't wait to hear more. And I can't wait to work with you outside of this. This is going to be exciting. I hope you're going to be at GritCon as well. So (laughs) So let's get to the last question. So as we close off this interview and close it up and wrap everything up, if you were to leave the listeners with some words of wisdom today, what would they be? I would say the biggest thing that helped me really find my purpose and what I wanted to do was to tap into my authenticity. So regardless of whatever you went through growing up or whatever people told you, false, you know, the intruder thoughts that come into your brain, really take time to identify mentors in your life that can help you push you further along, find people you can serve and really, and that'll also help you understand who you are because when you're authentic, you can move through life genuinely having confidence right one thing someone told me last week I I love her Her name um, Chandra has a beautiful business she told me wherever you go don't let someone dim your light you just give them you every time and you will find the right people because if you're always operating in yourself you never have to fake anything you never have to change yourself and if people side eye you that's okay but you can you can feel at peace with yourself because you're always operating in your authenticity. So that is my biggest thing. Try to be authentic as as much as you can, and you will have that confidence as well. Thank you so much, Destiny, for joining me on the Core Women podcast today. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone really took something from this podcast. So, Oh, absolutely. There's so much here. So thank you so much for joining me again. You can follow Destiny Amaris Perkins on Instagram at girlthatdes and on LinkedIn at Destiny Amaris Perkins. Thank you for joining us on the Core Women Podcast with Dr. Summer Watson. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect more with you. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Core Women and on Twitter at Core Women One. For more about Core Women and Dr. Watson, visit corewomen.com. Want more support and resources for amazing women like you? Great. Join Dr. Watson and Jen Fontanilla at the Life, Love & Money Collective, a core women production that aids in understanding the key traits that might be getting in the way of living a life that you are absolutely passionate about. Connect with Summer and Jen and find out more at thelifeloveandmoney.com.